Our second reading comes from the 37th chapter of the prophet Ezekiel. Ezekiel the prophet works during the time when Israel is defeated by Babylon and carried into exile. And uh, he speaks of that defeat and that exile as God's punishment on Israel even has in his prophecies a, a depiction of God's spirit leaving the temple, departing Israel. Uh, it's worth noting as you listen to the reading that the word Lord in here is uh, a device that we continue to use in our Bible, a, a device used by faithful Jews to avoid speaking God's proper name, but that each time you hear the word Lord or Lord God, that that proper name is actually spoken in the text. Listen now for what the Spirit would speak to us. The hand of the Lord came upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me all around them, and there were very many lying in the valley, and they were very dry. He said to me, Mortal, can these bones live? I answered, O oh Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, I will cause breath to enter you and, and you shall live. I will lay sinews on you and will cause flesh to come upon you and will cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I had been commanded and as I prophesied, suddenly there was a noise and a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. I looked, and there were sinews on them, and flesh had covered them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy mortal, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath and breathe upon these slain that they may live. I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, a vast multitude. Then he said to me, Mortal, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We are cut off completely. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you back to the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people. I will put my spirit within you and you shall live, and I will place you on your own soil. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken and will act, says the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> Can these bones live? That would seem to be an absurd question. The scene in Ezekiel's vision is one of utter and awful devastation a valley filled with sun-bleached bones. There's only one possible explanation. Some sort of horrible massacre has taken place. An army has totally annihilated an enemy. No one is left to bury the dead. An awful fate for a Jew. The fallen have been stripped of any valuables and then have been left to the birds and to the elements. In time, nothing is left but bones, dried out bones. Can these bones live? What an absurd question. But it seems the prophet knows better than to dismiss the absurd where God is involved, and so he answers, O oh Lord God, you know. The prophet Ezekiel has trashed the Israelites for their total failure to be God's faithful people. 
He says their defeat and exile by the Babylonians is God's doing, and it seems <coughs> that their, their story is at an end, that all is over, that God is done with them. And yet, can these bones live? Ezekiel says that Israel is these bones. But what of us? Can we speak of dry bones? Some say that the church in America is in exile and facing death. Some predict a, a European church landscape with church more as museum than as the body of Christ. And all across our country, individual congregations and denominations are facing death. Many in America are concerned about the plight of the middle class, the possible demise of the American dream. Is the promise of a better life for anyone who works hard dead? In politics and world events, there are countless problems and conflicts that seem endless and unsolvable. And surely each of us has at times experienced moments when all seems hopeless. <coughs> Relationships beyond repair, estrangement that cannot be healed, faith that has, has died that is lost and gone forever. Can these bones live? Can these bones live? Perhaps another way to ask the question is, is resurrection possible? Is new life possible? Now, it would seem difficult to be a Christian without some sort of belief in resurrection, but all too often that gets confined to what will happen when you die. But that's a very different question than can these bones live? And Jesus is speaking of something very different when he says, I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus says those words shortly before he raises Lazarus from the dead after four days in the tomb. He speaks them to Martha, Lazarus' sister, who already believes in a resurrection at the last day. But Jesus tells her that he is something bigger, something more than heaven at the end. I am the resurrection and the life, he says. These bones can live now. Still, it's easy to forget that the power of God is something more, something bigger than life after death. You would think the church, that that would be the last place that people would forget that God can work improbable, absurd, impossible endings but we do forget. We look out and we see stories where we cannot imagine any ending but a bad one, and we say, that's it, it's over, it's hopeless, without ever thinking that God might imagine a different, improbable, impossible ending. We forget even though our Christian story is about an absurd, impossible ending. Some years ago, Tom Long was preaching the, in the closing worship service at the Covenant Network Conference. And he preached a sermon reminding us that ours is a faith that features surprising, unexpected endings. That when we think things are hopeless, when everything seems to point to death and hopelessness and despair, that God can still bring forth life. Now, Long is a, a preaching professor, and he, was, he talked about a time when he was 
uh, leading a clergy event of some kind at a place quite a ways away on the other side of Atlanta from where he works. And so when a break came that was lengthy but without enough time for him to get back to his office and make it back for the, the seminar, he decided to get a haircut. And so he started looking for a fantastic Sam's or supercuts or something of that nature. And I'm just going to read you what he says. He says, I found one and went, I was, went and was in the chair. The woman was cutting my hair and she said, I don't recognize you. Have you ever been in here before? I told her no, that I was a Presbyterian minister and I was leading a clergy seminar. And she brightened up when I said this and said, oh, I'm a Christian too, you know. I said, really? And she said, yes, I'm a member of Creflo Dollar's church. You may not know Creflo Dollar, but he's the latest incarnation of the God wants you to be rich theology. He drives a black Rolls Royce. He has a corporate jet and his congregation has bought him millions of dollars in real estate. He's known locally as cash flow dollar. And here's this woman telling me, I'm a member of Creflo Dollar's church. I'm thinking to myself, I'm already getting a bad haircut, now I'm going to get bad theology as well. <laughs> but to be hospitable, I played along. She was holding a razor after all. <laughs> And I said, well, have you got your blessing yet? She said, oh yes, I've gotten my blessing all right. Well, tell me about it, I said, expecting her to say something about the Lexus in the parking lot or the diamond earrings in the scissors drawer. But instead she said, two nights a week I get to volunteer in a shelter for battered women. I was one myself, you know, and they trust me. They need me. They know I love them. I sat there silently thinking, my God, Jesus is loose in Creflo Dollar's church. <laughs> it's amazing the way that he does it. He hangs around in the parking lot refusing to go in, letting them gorge themselves on greed and selfishness until the witness to the gospel is dead. Absolutely dead. And when it is dead, then Jesus says, it's time for me to go in. We say to Jesus, don't go in that church, church Jesus. That one is dead, it's been dead for four days. Can't you smell it? It stinks. And Jesus said, this is not about death. This is about the glory of God. And he goes into Creflo Dollar's church and he finds a $9 an hour hair cutter and by the power of God, he ordains her to a ministry of trust and compassion. It's not hope that's running out of time. It's death that's running out of time. It's injustice that's running out of time. And if Jesus is loose in Creflo Dollar's church, Jesus is loose in the Presbyterian church too, says Tom Long. And if Jesus is loose, then God's power to make dry bones live is loose in the church and in the world. And all those places where we're certain that the story cannot have a good ending, where relationships are beyond repair, where the world seems hell-bent on going the wrong way, where all is hopeless and all is lost, are places where God can write absurd, improbable, impossible endings that we might never imagine or expect. But perhaps we should imagine and expect them. After all, 
we know the answer to that question. Can these bones live? All praise and glory to the God who brings hope out of hopelessness, life out of death. Thanks be to God.